But there are cases where, um, and this sort of ties together, this is more to do with the issue of personal identity than persons that we, we got into. Um, there are cases where people with uh, Alzheimer's or, or another form of dementia, uh, their personality can change radically. And there are a couple of cases that are, I mean, the movie um, Away From Her, I understand, has one example where, um, are you familiar with that film? Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. okay. So she uh, she falls in love with someone else and it's very hurtful for her husband, but, you know, should you let her because she's a different person? Well, actual cases, non-fictional cases, uh, one was where a woman had been a lifelong heterosexual and then she develops this uh, gay relationship in the, in the nursing home and they... And the family is very disproving because they are, you know, they do not condone homosexuality at all. And the nursing staff has to know should, uh, they're being told to keep these people apart who clearly love each other, you know, but they they in a in a non heterosexual way. And then another case was uh, a lifelong, uh, very strict vegetarian mm -hmm. who developed a taste the for meatballs. yeah yeah who who just wanted to eat nothing but uh, steaks. What would you say about that? Would you say that it was a different person? Would you say uh, that the narrative has changed radically, or, or is there something that you think you you your view right. has to say about something like that? Well, so the constitution of selves narrative view would clearly, I think, well, it depends on how much self-narrating capacity remains, but would likely say that this was a different person, but I'm not sure about, I mean, it would depend a lot on the details of the case, but could very easily say it's a different person. The current view, the notion, this expanded notion of personhood that I include, so one way of putting it also, my other sound, sound bite is I've got, because you know I learned this in seventh grade health class, it's a biopsychosocial view of person. So the way in which my book is in some sense a response to Olson is to say, I agree with you, infants and people with dementia are persons, and that no new thing pops into existence when you get the Lockean capacities. But not just because there's a single human being there, because actually we are types of beings in which the biological, psychological, and social aspects of our lives are so deeply intertwined and so mutually interdependent um, that they, in the ordinary case, cannot really be prized apart. But there are cases where they do start to come apart. And those are the cases that traditionally have been the cases of, you know, where personal identity uh, questions get going, like the cases you talk about. So the social part plays a huge role in the person life view. And so what I would say in the person life view is this is the same person because a person, so this is why I call it, um, I, I talk about person space, right? The idea is that a culture is a kind of person space. There are these, these no modes of interaction, these integrated modes of interaction that are people, right? So I interact with individuals. I know that other individuals interact with them. There's a wide gamut of practical concerns and interactions I might have with a person or not. But the person is somehow the locus of all of that. So it occupies a social, a place in social space. And so obviously in these cases, um, you know, in a way from her, this is very distressing to the husband, and we all understand why it's very distressing to the husband, uh, because this is his wife. And it's Julie Christie. And it's Julie Christie, <laughs> right, who no longer understands this or is acting in the ways that, you know, we expect, but we understand why she's not, and he can't really get angry, but right, and so on. Um, similarly, with the, you know, I mean, if it was just some other old, lady in the nursing home who wanted to have a homosexual relationship with another woman in the nursing home, the family wouldn't care. That's mom. <laughs> she doesn't do that. Um, and similarly with the, the vegetarian, it's because um, the 
the in the case of the the vegetarian, I guess he was in Sweden and he wanted them balls, right? His wife is saying, no, no, he's such a committed vegetarian. He just, I can't see him do that. Now, how you should actually respond to these people, whether it's right to prevent them from acting on their new, you know, very different personality. Yeah, I mean, would it be like taking away the car keys from a drunk person? Or is it something radically different from that? Well, so it possibly could be, but but I mean, it's not clear to me, but I think this is a different question, and there's, of course, a huge literature on it um, that I'm only partially aware of. It doesn't seem to be obvious that you should try to make the behavior of people with dementia comport with the behavior they had before they had dementia rather than just letting them do what makes them happy now. So, but it seems to me, you know, this I would take from Olson, but again, for different reasons. You can perfectly well say, dad was a committed vegetarian all those years, and it breaks my heart to see him eating meat. But all things considered, given the, given the state he's in now and how agitated he gets when we don't let him and how little time he has left to live and we've gone on his behalf and made sure that it's responsibly sourced, humanely treated meatballs, this is the right thing to do, right? You don't have to say this isn't dad to say that he should be allowed to eat meatballs. I think it gets more complicated if maybe he was like a Hindu or something and, you know, he's eating cows now. Well, it might be. And then you might decide the right thing to do on his behalf is to keep him from doing it. And by the way, these particular people have the right to make that demand because that's their father who they have a lifelong relationship with, right? <laughs> and not because he's some other random person. I don't want my kids hearing that. Yeah, well, <laughs> write out the instructions very carefully. That's my advice to you. So, yeah. So, I mean... But it seems to me that the bulk of our practices supports the idea that this is the same person. It's just this is the same person in these very problematic but not uncommon and not unpredictable situation. But in terms of narrative, is it just that this their narrative took a strange turn? Or, I mean, it sounds like something that they would never have conceived of part of, I mean... It, Previously, they would have denied that that could be part of their narrative. Right. So what I would say is something like it's, it's not the same Lockean person. Unless this person is like still quite high functioning and has a really good story to tell about how, you know, no, my dementia has freed my mind from all those years of, you know, um, <laughs> academic. What a pious jerk I was back then. Right, right. And all those academics making me be vegetarian and now. <laughs> but... But right, but because we have a particular understanding of what dementia is and how it interferes with executive functioning and so on, um, we have a perfectly good story to tell. So what I would say is, look, you know, Olson says at some point, look, if you want to, he thinks we're just human beings and you're human animals, but he says, look, if you want to have a notion of person, find have a notion of person. Just know that it's not a thing, right? A person isn't a thing. I think a person is a thing, but only this more basic sense of person. I'm willing to acknowledge that a Lockean person, if we want to use that term, isn't a, an entity. So we can certainly say dad's a different person now that he has dementia. But I think our practice shows we don't really believe that, not only because we go visit dad instead of someone else, but because... We feel it's beholden on us if he's a lifelong Hindu not to let him eat beef. So, so yeah, so I think, so, so what I'd want to do now is distinguish between, you know, one way of putting it is between self, which is capturing what I was trying to get in the narrative view, and person, which is this more social and biologically grounded notion, um, but connects to self, not quite as a spider to a web, but. Yeah. But not completely unlike that. So is, uh, are there uh, directions you're interested in going now? Is there a project you're currently working on? Or are you still recovering from the last book? 
No, I, I, I do have a project I'm hoping to get started on, at least. I've got a little bits and pieces, and it will even bring in a little bit. I know we don't have time to talk about episodics. We'll leave that for another day, but it brings yeah. in a little of that. Um, what I want to do is go back to this notion of self um, and the phenomenological connection, because I do feel that I never really solved that problem to my satisfaction. I mean, I think the narrative view is a step in the right direction, but I think there are all kinds of um, loose ends. Like how um, long does a self last, exist for? That's a really good question. And what happens when you go to sleep and so on? And what happens if you change dramatically and, and that sort of thing? Um, and so one of the ways I'm getting back into this, there is, as you've known, been a lot of pushback on the notion of narrative. Um, some of it from Galen Strawson, who says, hey, I have no narrative conception of my life. I'm an episodic. I live, you know, each episode as it comes, and I don't think much about the past or the future or how it all connects. And Do I you buy great. that? What? Do you buy that? I mean, you're, you're willing to say that, uh, yes, I... I I mean, I think there's a, there's an obvious sense in which there are some people who are happy-go-lucky or, you mm -hmm. know, I'm not going to feel guilty about that. Yeah, sure, I, was, I did something terrible when I was a kid, but I was a kid, you know, that, that was a kid. They, but the whole I versus I star business. Well, so I buy it and I don't. And, and here's the way in which I finally figured out. So I've gotten this far. So, you know, it always seemed to me like, well, by the time that you're sitting there saying, I'm a happy-go-lucky person, I don't care about episodes, I've never cared about episodes, I'm not going to care about episodes, or I mean, I don't care about the narrative, and I won't care about narrative in the future, you've already told a story. So, so isn't that just showing that he really does have a narrative conception of self? And, and I've been able to have some back and forth with him, and this is what I think. So he says, look, there's this conception of I star, which is myself. And then there's this conception GS, which is Galen Strawson. I know I have a human history. Every time you press him and say, but you talk about what happened in your past and how it influenced what you're doing now. And you talk about where you, you know, want to go in the future. Talk he about says, yeah, how that's difficult all. you were for your dad. Right. That's all GS, right? That's all about, um, knowing about the history of Galen Strawson, and it's that which allows him to know that he has to pay the bills for the, you know, the mortgage for the house that GS uh, signed the contract on, and right, he knows where to go home and all of that, because that's all the history of GS. So I get one sense in which he means he's episodic, and I certainly think that I have experienced it myself, which is... Um, Sometimes things that you know you did in the past just seem really remote, right? Increasingly so, as, as I get, you know, I mean, I sort of can't think myself back into it. It's like, yes, I know about it, but I have this sort of distance that it's almost as if, you know, I'm hearing about someone else. Well, and, and like my sister will, you know, I'll say I like this. And my sister says, you can't like that. You, you always hated that, you know, and I said, well, People change, you know. Now I like it. Yeah, then I right. didn't. So that I understand, and I understand, you know, I tried once to, to develop this notion of empathic access, this idea that you can remember the past very well. I, I tend toward nostalgia, so it bothers me, but Strassen celebrates it. You know, it's like I remember how much fun I had with my friends in high school and how, you know, I listened to, to uh, you know, music with them and I thought I don't ever you know going back to the person who's the the hippie to yuppie thing like you know I don't ever want to lose this and you know this come and then now I think back and it's like yeah I was a teenager or whatever right? yeah there are some <laughs> albums you should never listen to again as an adult right. <laughs> right but there's the difference between the way in which you are that person when you're listening to the album and it all comes rushing back in this mm -hmm. pristine moment and the way in which you are that person when you're in your day-to-day -day life and you know that you did those things as a teenager, but that was a million years ago. And so I understand that difference. And if that's the I star difference, you know, fine. But what I think 
Um, what I've come to think is that the Strawson means something deeper by it because he, he of course wants this to be sort of a metaphysical thing as well as a, I mean, it's not completely clear to me. And so the way that I would sort of put it is this. I think, um, he says that the, the pronoun I is ambiguous between referring to G.S. Galen Strawson, this thing that, that exists over time, and him star, who's just right here. So when he says, you know, I am this kind of philosopher, you don't know whether he means I star or whether he means I Galen Strawson. And he's fine with that. That I is two things. To me, I am not fine with that in the following sense. I can believe that I am an extended being who changes over time. But then there's just one I. But that I am two things here, this, you know, self and also some extended thing seems very strange and also very alienating. I mean, the best example I could come up with is when he says, you know, I star don't think I'm the guy who, you know, made that promise. But since I know GS did and I star am also GS, I guess I better fulfill the promise. It's like saying, well, you know, I don't really feel anything about these kids, but I guess they're mine. So I'll raise them. Right. Well, and it seems like suppose uh, as you know, uh, the example has been used. Imagine some of your memories you knew had been implanted. You just didn't know which ones, but presumably he wouldn't care which ones. Right, right. So so what I think is there's some cheating going on because all the hard work is being sloughed off on this idea that, well, there's this GS that, you know, can do all the work that every time you say, but look, you know, you say this or that or the other, which shows you have a narrative. He says, well, I don't, I star don't have a narrative. GS has a narrative or whatever. So what I want to do, but, but what it got me to thinking is that really if you want to, so, so there's that discussion and then there's one other piece and then it'll get quickly to where I'm going in the future. So I'm, the other piece of pushback against the notion of narrative is just to say, no, our lives are not anything like narratives. Narratives are neat and tidy. They have exposition, crisis, and resolution, and then they're done, and they all live happily ever after or not, but it's done, um, and the loose ends are tied up, and everything that happens in a narrative is there for an aesthetic purpose. So if you're reading a novel and it's foggy, you should think about what that means about the state of the protagonist's soul, but if you go outside and it's foggy, you don't need to worry about what that says about the state of your soul and so on, right? Um, an accident, right? so on. So, I mean, obviously, a life is not like a literary narrative. So the the pressure that also comes from Strassen is, well, then tell me in what sense it is like a narrative that's non-trivial. And so part of what I wanted to do for a while, I thought I would just get rid of the notion of narrative. But really what I finally decided is that what I want to do is explain what I mean by narrative. And what I think um, I'm, and the way into it is this business about the ambiguity of I star and I, because Peter Goldie has very helpfully, um, in what is tragically his last book, uh, explained the, the idea of narrative in terms of the ability to occupy multiple perspectives at once. And Goldie and I disagree on a lot of things, but what I, I think is wrong in Strawson's view is he thinks that you can just unproblematically occupy these multiple multiple perspectives. But what I think is that as persons or selves in this case, what we're left with is the task of seeing how they can all be mine, right? I have a lot of different perspectives. I know my current one is just one of many. I know I'll have future ones that will be different. I know I've had past ones that were different and yet they're somehow all mine. And I really think that talking about the way we negotiate that can help explain the phenomenology of our experiencing ourselves as extended in time. So really what I want to do is go back to that. And of course, it um, actually, that makes me think of uh, Nagel's discussion of the absurd. You know, that's why human life is absurd, because we can adopt two different viewpoints We uh, with the viewpoint of us in the car and the viewpoint of from above looking down at the car and it's because the mouse can't do that that its life is not absurd. So absurdity could be part of personhood. 
And I think it very well <laughs> might turn out to be. Yeah. Well, I have kept you for way too long, so I'm uh, I'm gonna thank you. And uh, yeah, but uh, I mean, I have more questions, so maybe we'll, we will have to do this again. Oh well, that would be that would be. It was really fun talking to you, and yeah, I hope great. things are going well in Flint and as well as they can in Flint. Yeah, we put out that major trash fire that didn't last more than a couple of days, so so it's <laughs> good times in Flint. But how's the mall? Oh, well, Dort Mall is, uh, is is still hasn't been used as a setting for a for a horror movie, so its uh, its potential has been unexploited. But maybe one day. All right. Well, I will. Like to, thanks so much, though. It was really fun. Sure. It was great talking to you. Talk to you again right. soon, Maria. Bye bye.